In this video, we are going to look at the topic of Verilog simulation, especially from the point of view of topics that we need to understand in order to see what is synthesizable and what is not, and how we should accurately go about modeling digital systems. We will first look at what events are and the topic of sensitivity, or in other words, how events are evaluated. We will then briefly look at delays as they are modeled in Verilog and then talk about some guidelines for effectively writing Verilog in such a way that it will result in synthesizable logic. So what is an event? Any update in the value of a signal is considered an event. In the context of Verilog, the signal itself corresponds to either a wire or a register inside the code. For example, if we have a structural model, an AND gate, let's say U1 with an output Y and two inputs A and B, a change in the value of y is considered an event. Of course, changes in a and b are also events, but y is the output event generated by the AND gate. Instead, if we wrote exactly the same code, but in a slightly different fashion using a continuous assignment statement, that is the data flow type of model, then we would once again find that we could write it as assign y is equal to a ampersand b, which implements exactly the same functionality as the structural logic. And now once again, the event that can be generated by this line of code would be a change in the value of y. And finally, we have the behavioral style of modeling where we would use always at a or b, y is equal to a ampersand b. Now, when we talk about changes in signals, we need to understand what are the possible values. And this is usually considered as the four value logic simulation. And the values that we are talking about are 0, 1, x, and z, where 0 and 1 correspond to the regular logic as we understand it. x essentially means an unknown quantity, and z refers to a specific state known as a tri-state. Now, tri-states in physical circuits have a very specific meaning. They essentially correspond to a floating terminal, meaning that it is not actively connected to either VDT or ground. And therefore, you cannot say what the voltage is at that point. Now, Verilog does not really deal with voltages. So all that it means in this case is that the net is not driven. And this concept of driving gates is important to understanding how Verilog goes about modeling digital hardware. For example, in, the, uh, in all the three pieces of code that we have over here, y is being driven by some logic, either in the first case directly by the output of the AND gate, or in the second case, y is driven by the logic assignment A and B. And similarly, in the behavioral assignment, y is driven by the line of code A and B. Therefore, you may come across error messages that discuss the driving logic corresponding to a given signal. This is essentially what it corresponds to. So what are the effects that can be generated by an event? Events trigger evaluation of logic, which in turn leads to further events. We'll look at some examples as we move forward. The other thing that events can do is to result in some notion of passage of time. In particular, there are two things. One is the concept of causality where they cause a time ordering of events. That is events happening one after another. The second is the concept of a delay, or in other words, a physical delay amount, maybe one nanosecond, maybe several picoseconds, some numbers that can be used inside the very log model. Events further are evaluated by means of sensitivity lists. In the examples that we see over here, the A or B is the sensitivity list of the first always block. What this means is any change in either the value of A or the value of B will result in this always block getting evaluated. In this case, evaluating the always block will just result in updating the value of Y. So what we have is an event over here would trigger the evaluation of y is equal to a ampersand b and that in turn 
will generate a new event. Well, it may or may not generate a new event. Therefore, I'll put it with a question mark. The reason I say it may or may not is, let's say that A is equal to zero, any change in B will actually not cause the value of Y to change, which means that the value of Y does, uh, since it does not change, does not correspond to an actual event that needs to then be further evaluated. Now, the second always block that is shown over here corresponds roughly to what you would see in a D-type flip-flop. And what we have is always at passage clock begin if reset Q equal to zero, else Q equal to D. The main difference you would notice from the previous always block is that D and reset are not in the sensitivity list. And this is essentially a sort of specialized form of modeling. Right? We know that there are certain things called edge triggered flip-flops and the concept of a posage and negage in Verilog were introduced primarily to model such systems. Therefore, we have a always block where even though there are multiple elements that need to be evaluated inside the block, reset for example, I might need to check the value of reset or I might need to check the value of D. None of them by themselves can cause the block to get evaluated. Only when the clock changes, in other words, when it has a posage, will the entire block get evaluated and result in an update in the value of Q. Now, the way that events get evaluated can result in something called evaluation cycles. What that means is that one event could then further generate another event. And the question then becomes, at what time are all of these events occurring? Let's consider a scenario where the values A, B, C, D, and Y are shown over here. Let's assume that D is equal to zero, so it doesn't really matter anywhere in the picture. A is initially zero, as is B, which means that the initial value of C would evaluate to zero. Why does this happen? Because as soon as the system starts up and the evaluation starts happening, and when I give a value A is equal to zero somewhere, let's say in my test bench, that in turn, it's itself an event because A has now changed from the value X, which is unknown to the value zero, which is a known quantity. Even that is considered an event and will cause this block to get evaluated and the value of Y to get updated. On the other hand, in my test bench, if I don't assign any values to A and B, then you will actually find that until such time as some value is assigned over there, the value of C actually remains unknown. All right, now let's see what happens if A changes from zero to one, but B remains the same. What happens is that I do have an event generated here. That in turn will result in something getting updated. The value of C is re-evaluated, but it turns out that it just continues with the value zero. So no further event is generated. On the other hand, let's say that after a little further, a little more time, B changes from zero to one, while A in turn remains at one. What this means is this is a new event and that in turn will cause C to get evaluated and C will change to one at this point because both A and B are now equal to one. Now, what this in turn means is that this is a new event. It resulted from the change in B. But if you look at it, in some sense, these happen one after another. We have to be able to maintain the fact that the change in C happened after the change in B. But since we do not have any delay specified over here, when I look at the waveform, it looks as though B and C change simultaneously. And in fact, the question that can arise is which one changed first? Because the blue arrows that I've drawn here do not actually exist in the Verilog simulator or in any output that it generates. Therefore, there must be something else that allows us to keep track of the fact that C happens, the change in C happens after the change in B. This essentially leads us to something called a simulation 
delta time step. Now, this notion of a delta is actually from VHDL and not from Verilog. In fact, Verilog does not really have the con concept of a delta time step, but it makes sense to sort of visualize the changes that are happening here in terms of deltas. Right? So one thing to keep in mind, the notion of a simulation delta is actually not part of Verilog. If you really go into how Verilog works, it does not talk about simulation deltas. It only talks about events as we'll see in a moment. So how does this help us? The delta is just a good way of visualizing what is happening. It allows us to think of a small time gap between the change in P and the corresponding change in C. And what we can say is this change in C in turn leads to a change in Y. So what we can see is the blue lines essentially show the first events, A and B. The change in B in turn triggers another event in C, which happens in the next time step. That is to say it was a generated event, which happened a short while after the first event. And that in turn causes a change in Y. And the important thing to keep in mind over here is that all of these operations happen notionally at the same time. But B, then C, and then Y. And these are essentially what correspond to the different simulation deltas or the time steps. They are effectively zero time intervals that separate out what happened at different, uh, the, the sequence in which the events happened. So delta delays, in other words, correspond to an abstraction. They are not an actual increment in time. They do specify the ordering of the events and they allow us to enforce a specific ordering. What this in turn means is that the way Verilog works, and in fact, the Verilog language reference manual itself the simulation reference manual specifies something called event queues. Each of these changes that we saw earlier, the change in A, the change in B, etc., is inserted into the queue. So this essentially an active queue would consist of a list, which would basically say some kind of a timestamp, which would be some integer value. And the event itself. A zero to one, for example. Then the next one would basically be timestamp two, and there would be B zero to one. So these, for example, could be the active queue, right? Each one would essentially correspond to a given timestamp and it would have the nature of the event. What we are interested in, first of all, is to pick out all the events that happen at a given timestamp and evaluate all of them. So first we go through and evaluate everything in the so-called active queue. These are the events that actually need to be evaluated before moving forward. The inactive queue, I'm actually just going to ignore it for now. This essentially corresponds to a special form called hash zero delays, which essentially the only simple thing to say is don't use them, right? Unless you really know what you are doing. For all of these things, by the way, there are some very nicely written articles uh, by Clifford Cummings, which have been uh, of Sunburst design, which have been uploaded onto the uh, class, web, uh, class website, and you can go through them. Now, okay, so the inactive queue effectively is something that we are not going to bother about any further. The important thing then is the non-blocking assignments. And this is essentially what happens after the active queue has been evaluated. So now you can see that what actually happens when I do a non-blocking assignment, let's say something like Q less than equal to D, this basically results in evaluate change in D, which was on the active queue, push to the non-blocking queue. And in other words, only after all elements in the active queue are evaluated, will we move on to the non-blocking queue. And this is precisely how non-blocking assignments are done. Effectively, what we say is 
a non-blocking assignment does not have a delay associated with it. So it sort of looks as though Q equal to D, Q less than equal to D takes on the value, Q takes on the value of D at precisely the same time instant when D was evaluated. But because it's non-blocking, it says defer this. Finish processing everything in the active Q and then get back to processing the non-blocking assignments. And that is how the effective ordering saying that all the non-blocking assignments happen later after the initial active queue is done. We have two further queues which are basically the monitors and the future queue. The monitors are basically used for basically the dollar monitor statement in Verilog or the dollar strobe statement. Any change in any signal value can be monitored and its value displayed. This is just primarily for debugging. It's not part of the evaluation process itself and cannot result in a signal getting changed. The future queue essentially corresponds to things that happen at a different time. So for example, if I wanted to model something where I said that the AND gate had a certain delay and therefore A and B should result in the value of one going into C, but after one nanosecond, this is the queue that I would insert the event into. This is a snapshot of the algorithm that is actually specified by the simulation reference manual for Verilog. Uh, don't worry too much about the algorithm. You're not expected to understand it fully, but it does make sense to sort of go through and understand what it is. You can clearly see that the primary thing is to look for active events. After that, as we said, the inactive events can sort of be written off. We don't really have anything happening over here. Then the important thing is the non-blocking assignment update. So in other words, this is important. This is important. The other ones are less so. The monitor events, for example, are just something that are required for debugging. And finally, we have this notion of advanced T to the next time. This next event time, we of course are going to assume that T is an integer. And is that a reasonable assumption? Well, yes, it is an assumption that you have to sort of make at some level in order to get a properly simulatable system, but it's not a fundamental necessity. It just, it's primarily also for convenience of implementing the simulator. Effectively, what it does in this case is it can just look through the queues that are present, find out the one with the smallest timestamp and just advance time to that timestamp. There would be inactive events at that point in time, which basically correspond because they were pushed into the future queue at some previous stage activate all of them and rerun the loop. And finally, what we can see is you basically after this go through and evaluate all processes, update the modified objects and so on. The rest of it basically goes through. So in other words, the primary thing is going to be just this question of how do you maintain this queue of events and the fact that non-blocking assignments are handled using a separate queue. VHDL incidentally handles all of this in a slightly different manner. It does use the concept of simulation deltas but ultimately this concept of event driven simulation is a core concept in both of these techniques, both of these languages, right? We do need to be able to handle the production and effects of events. And that is the most important thing in the simulation of the language. Coming to the next topic, which is delays in very log models. There are two primary types of delays that are, that need to be modeled in a language like Verilog. One of them is the so-called transport delay. The idea of a transport delay is something like a wire delay. Essentially what we are saying is if A is less than or equal to hash five B, then effectively what we are saying over here is A is, let's consider the two signals A and B and let's say A changes to some value. After a delay of five time units, B will then change. Now, what if A then changes once again, briefly to zero and then back again? What we would expect is that B pretty much follows that. 
and we see exactly the same behavior out here. So in other words, the delay between this to this would also be five and from here to here would also be five. And it doesn't really matter how narrow or how wide this pulse is. This could be, for example, anything. It could be two, for example. Right? So why do we say that this model is a wire delay? Because this is essentially the kind of behavior that you would expect to see in a wire. If there is a change in a signal, yes, there is some delay in propagating across the wire. But finally, the other end of the wire does see exactly the same set of changes that were there to start with. Well, this is of course an ab abstraction and an idealization, but it's a good way of understanding how a wire behaves. On the other hand, let's look at something called an inertial delay. Inertial delay essentially says something like this. Let's say that I have two signals out here, A and B, and there is a gate. What happens inside the gate is some kind of evaluation. There are transistors, there are charging and discharging of capacitances, a whole bunch of different things out there. So now what if we have a situation where let's say A has the value one and B is initially zero and then goes up to one. What do we expect? Let me just undo that. Yeah, let's say that B initially goes up to one. What we would expect is that with this five time units later, I would actually expect Y to get this value. But what if B instead was to go through like this, that is to say B goes high and then goes low very quickly thereafter. Right? So I once again have A, I have B and let's say that the duration of this is only one nanosecond. Effectively what we are saying in other words is at this point, what happens five nanoseconds later and what happens five nanoseconds after this, they sort of cancel each other out. And what I have is there would be one evaluation out here and one evaluation out here. But the net result is that because B did not remain high for the entire duration until this delay, until this point over here, B just remains zero. On the other hand, let's say that after some time it goes high and remains high for six nanoseconds. Now at this point, what I would find is that with a delay of five nanoseconds from the point of the first signal, I would actually see Y changing. And from the point that it fell down, I would see another change over here. In other words, effectively what we are saying is the gate shows some kind of inertia. If the pulse on the input that it is seeing is too short, less than the inertial delay associated with it, it will simply not change in value. Now, once again, this is an, in, not an oversimplification, but at least a drastic simplification of what is actually happening inside the gate. Inside the gate, there are transistors, there are capacitors, there are current sources. Some amount of charge is being transferred onto a capacitance. It is causing some voltages to change. All that now has to be abstracted away and modeled as some kind of a signal changing from zero to one with a certain delay. That's what we have here. Once we take this abstra abstraction, what we say is the inertial delay of five time units essentially corresponds just to having the small change as we see over here. If the change is, if the duration of the change is too small, one nanosecond, let's say, then the change is just ignored. On the other hand, as long as the duration is greater than the actual inertial delay, the entire change will reflect faithfully at the output. Now, having said all this, there are a few guidelines that are recommended in order to get good synthesizable code. First and foremost would be if you need to rely on certain delay values in order to get the correct functionality, 
from your Verilog code, it probably means there are concerns or possibly even mistakes in your model. In other words, you should be able to get the entire design working without having to resort to actually bringing delays inside the model. The only place where delays are absolutely necessary is let's say that you're trying to actually model the Verilog corresponding to a phase locked loop or some kind of timing sensitive circuit. In most digital logic, you should not need to worry about the delay that is present and whether it is inertial delay and whether it is transport delay. At least for the level that we'll be using in the computer organization course, you can pretty much just ignore the whole concept of delays and you should be able to do all your modeling without having to resort to those delays. Like I said, adding delay on the right hand side of a non-blocking assignment can model a transport delay. Now there is one place where this can actually be useful. What it does is going back to the earlier example we saw where we essentially had the A and B changes resulting in a change in C and therefore that in turn triggering a change in Y. If we had given some hash one unit delays, those delays would actually have shown up on the waveform that we finally plot and look at and would therefore have been making it a, a little bit easier for us to debug the circuit. Once again, the same thing. Ideally, your circuit at least should not, the behavior of the circuit or the functionality should definitely not change as a result of introducing this transport delay. For the simple reason that all of these delays are just going to get ignored when you go to synthesis. If you need a hash one delay for a circuit to work, and if it is hash two or if it is hash 0 0.5, it is not going to work, you can pretty much be sure that it will not work in practice because there is no way that a physical compiler can actually synthesize a precise one nanosecond delay. One thing you can do if you do need to model such delays, and especially if you need to model inertial delay, rather than trying to directly code the delay into the left-hand side or right-hand side of an always block, it is better to use an always block without any delays in it to evaluate the combinational logic and then use an external assign statement with delay if necessary as shown to model the inertial delay. The reason is that the assigned statements have a very clear interpretation of how the delay is assigned and what exactly it implies for the simulation and modeling of the circuit. And it becomes generally easier to understand when it is used in that context rather than having delay inside an always block. One important parameter to keep in mind when writing Verilog code is to specify the time scale involved in the simulation. In particular, you need to keep in mind that if you do not specify the time scale, there is a good chance that the internal Verilog code will end up using a different time scale from what you had in mind. And therefore, any delays that you specify as hash one or hash 10 will be interpreted according to that time scale and not according to what you had in mind. Now, there are two components to a time scale. This essentially says that a hash one corresponds to one nanosecond. And this says, what is the resolution? So the slash one picosecond over here essentially corresponds to the resolution. What this means is a delay of 1.0 nanoseconds will correspond to 1.0 nanoseconds. 1.1 will correspond to 1.1, etc. But 1.2345 will now be rounded off and will become 1.235 because the resolution is limited to three decimals. If on the other hand, we had something like one nanosecond slash one nanosecond, this essentially corresponds to one, 1 1.0 would correspond to one, 1 1.1 would also correspond to one, 1.2345 would also correspond to one because the resolution is also only one nanosecond. It does not permit fractional. You can give any kind of resolution. You could give a one nanosecond slash 100 picosecond resolution to allow one decimal. One nanosecond slash 10 picosecond to allow two. One nanosecond slash one femtosecond to allow six, for example. But in general, it is always safer that every design and every test bench that you write should specify the time scale you are going to use in your internal logic. The standard delay format is something which is used to 
do something called back annotation. Essentially what we do over here is after the Verilog code has been synthesized, we need to take the delays that were present in that code and refer them back to the synthesized netlist. So you may have written code that did not have any delays associated with it, but after synthesis, every gate and every assignment inside the resulting Verilog code has some delays associated with it because it essentially is corresponds to something in hardware. We can do something called a timing simulation by taking all of those delays and actually annotating them back into the synthesized Verilog code. And usually this is done using fairly accurate delay models taking into account various things such as average temperature or average operating conditions, the operating voltage, the temperature, environment, and so on. Now, ideally, this kind of timing simulation should not be required. If you recall, static timing analysis is sufficient to tell us exactly what is the critical path and therefore at what frequency a given circuit can operate. However, there can be certain situations where static timing analysis can be difficult and in particular, you might have a situation where you want to do some kind of corner case analysis. You want to know rather than just doing a pessimistic static timing analysis, you want to be able to say, will the circuit fail or work under different environmental conditions? In some cases, it is easier therefore to just do a timing simulation rather than doing all the timing analysis under different corner case conditions. The problem of course over here is that the timing simulation in general takes longer in a, to perform than a simulation that is purely functional and does not take timing into account. Regarding test benches, in test benches, we typically use blocking assignments inside initial blocks. This is where we directly update the values of various inputs to the other blocks under test. So unlike the always block, you would have initial blocks where you are actually going to assign different values. And this in turn would be seen by the different blocks that are present in the system. There can be situations where you might also want to implement non-blocking assignments, but typically test benches try and keep them as simple as possible so that you do not mix different kinds of blocking and non-blocking assignments into them. It is useful inside a test bench to use the hash in delay format in order to supply a delay or to delay the input by a certain amount. In particular, we can use this in order to say that a particular input to a module gets updated a certain time after a clock edge or well before the clock edge so that setup time etc can be taken into account. One interesting practice that is often used inside test benches is to change values at the negative edge of the clock, even though the design itself uses the positive edge of the clock. The reason is exactly the same as before. You want to make sure that all signals are ready and stable well before the setup time required for the flip-flop. Now, even though we might be doing an ideal Verilog simulation and there is really no setup time or hold time to evaluate, no numbers associated with them. Because of the fact that signals can all change close to these edges, it is safer to make sure that the signals going into a block are modified well before we actually get to the block. Since these only apply to the signals that are applied from the test bench into the module and therefore are effectively external signals, even when you do timing simulation, you should find that this actually works out well in practice. On the other hand, if you do find that there is a combinational element to the computation that happens just after the signal enters the block before it reaches the first flip-flop, then you might find that rather than using the negage, you need some other way by which you can actually apply the events so that there is no race condition or timing error at the inputs to the flip-flops.